an increasingly common designation for the Old Testament is Hebrew Bible. Too often, old connotes something passé or irrelevant. This is certainly not true for the 39 books that comprise two-thirds of the Bible and are foundational for understanding the New Testament, especially the life and ministry of Jesus, who quoted frequently from the Jewish scriptures. Two common ways to read the Bible are devotionally or scientifically. I want to advocate in this lecture for a contextual approach. A person who reads the Bible devotionally tends to focus on what the Bible is saying to me today and ignore the concerns of the original audience. A person who reads the Bible scientifically tends to focus on what the Bible is saying in the past and ignore its relevance today. This is why I prefer a contextual approach. Rather than focusing only on our world or their world, Reading the Bible should be a dialogue or a conversation between the past and the present. If we read the Bible contextually, it is possible to build a bridge across the chasm of time and culture using three interrelated sources of information. Literary context, historical context, and cultural context. Let us first look at literary context. Much of what we understand about life is culturally communicated. Modern cartoonists exploit misunderstandings of culturally informed idioms to create humor. Only if you are familiar with the saying do you get the joke. The pun shown here should be obvious to most of us. A fork in the road. In the same way, differences in time and culture can create misunderstandings of ideas or traditions. This Christmas ornament made in China, illustrates how traditions can be misunderstood when viewed from outside the home culture. This Santa has wings because the manufacturers conflated an angel, which has wings, with Santa Claus, who does not. An important skill you will develop in this class is how to distinguish genre, the type or kind of literature. We instinctively recognize most genres without a thought. For example, most of us easily recognize that a document beginning with Dear Frank is a letter. If you read the phrase once upon a time in a book, you instinctively know that we are dealing with a fairy tale. What about So Help Me God? If you watch cop shows, then you'll recognize this as an oath made in a court of law. Finally, he is survived by his wife, Sally, two sons, and a brother in Tulsa is an obituary. Each of these four, letter, fairy tale, oath, and obituary, represent different genres. You will find the same variety in the Bible. Many Christians like to say that they read the Bible literally, but no one reads the entire Bible literally. If you did, you would believe God is a rock because the psalmist writes, God is my rock and my salvation. Or when Isaiah says, the trees will clap their hands, you would be saying that, that trees have hands. And when Jesus says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out, would you carry out that literally? My plea is not to read the Bible literally. Rather, read the Bible literarily. In other words, take the genre into account when you read. Certainly, some passages are to be taken literally, but others, like the clapping trees and plucking out one's eye, were meant to be taken figuratively to make a theological point. The second source of information is historical context. In our next lesson, we will learn about the geographical and historical setting of the Bible. Both are examples of historical context. In this drawing of David fighting Goliath, note how Goliath is depicted in Roman military garb, even though Goliath lived a thousand years before the Romans. The artist drew Goliath in this way because they did not know what Philistines looked like. However, thanks to archaeology, we have depictions of Philistines from the times in which they lived. The photo on the right is from a temple of Ramses III. 
To better visualize their appearance, look at this watercolor of the same depiction. The Philistines are the ones wearing feather headdresses, leather body armor and kilts, and carrying round shields. Such ancient drawings allow us to accurately depict Goliath's appearance. The third and final source of information is cultural context. After Adam and Eve are expelled from the Garden of Eden, God placed two cherubim with flashing swords at the entrance to the garden so the couple could not re-enter. What did these cherubim look like? Most artists depict cherubim as angels, as shown in the drawing. Others depict them as cupids, little babies shooting arrows. But in light of ancient depictions of cherubim, we know that they were something different. These are cherubim composite human and animal beings. Both photos show Israelite depictions of cherubim, so insisting that they are angels is not accepting how the Israelites visualized cherubim. Such beings were not only common to Israel, but in the surrounding cultures as well. The famous Sphinx from Giza in Egypt is actually a cherub. So what were they? Cherubim were divine beings that guarded things that were sacred so you tend to find them guarding the entrances of temples and palaces. In Genesis 3, they guard access to the Tree of Life, itself a common ancient Near Eastern symbol, as shown in this drawing of two cherubim flanking the Tree of Life. Let us conclude this lesson with four terms and three tools. The first term is context. This is what we've been talking about the entire time reading the Bible in light of its original context. The second term is hermeneutics, a Greek word meaning interpretation, used by scholars to refer to responsible biblical interpretation by applying the principles of exegesis. In Greek, ex means out, eis means into. We want to do exegesis by drawing meaning out of the Bible and letting it speak for itself. We do not want to do eisegesis, which is to read our own biased ideas into the Bible. Proper exegesis is aided by three tools. The concordance catalogs every word in the Bible and shows you where that particular word appears. It also cites the verse in which the word appears to provide context. The second tool is the Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia. These define a variety of words, terms, or concepts, like a regular dictionary or encyclopedia. The third tool is the commentary, which discusses each book of the Bible verse by verse. These are good for in-depth Bible study and give you insights into the genre, historical background, and theological relevance. Contrary to rumor, The goal of academic Bible study is not to deconstruct one's faith. Let me be clear, APU professors do not deconstruct faith. What professors deconstruct, or perhaps better, challenge, are one's presuppositions about their faith. There is a huge difference. With this, we close. Thank you for your time and attention.